we're going to make this sort of ask me anything. Um, uh, the only caveat I'll say is be a little bit mindful of there may be a whole bunch of questions. If you ask a super, super detailed one about 2.9.1.2 .2 and we don't have time to get through it, we'll get it at the beers. But ask anything you want. So real quick, uh, starting the left, Mark, go ahead, do a quick introduction. What area you focus on? Uh, my name is Mark Curry, OpenShift Product Manager and uh, for Container Infrastructure. And so that includes things like networking, master node, end-to-end -end provider integration, and so on. Hi, my name is Mike Barrett. I'm also a product manager. I look after the core Kubernetes technologies and look after the, pretty much the uh, go-to-market or the release. I'm gonna put the, where Hi, Steve at? Spiker. I look after the user interface, developer experience, uh, continuous delivery, online, and dedicated. And I'm Joe Fernandes. I run the product management team for OpenShift. Kirsten, Kirsten Newcomer, focused on uh, DevSecOps and security, uh, along with come up a couple of the other PMs. Uh, I'm Jimmy Zielinski. I am PMing Quay and everything operators at CoreOS slash Red Hat. Yeah, and this is just a subset of our product management team. Not everybody could be here today. But uh, first, I'd like to thank everybody who stuck around for the day. Uh, hopefully, you all appreciated the event. I would like to thank all of our customer presenters. We had uh, 24 sessions today. Hopefully, you guys like the format. Um, I know you hear from Red Hat a lot. You'll hear from Red Hat all week. Uh, we figured, you know, if you could hear directly from customers about what they're doing, what they're experiencing, uh, it would be a good outcome. Uh, this is your chance to ask questions. Actually, one last thing. I want to thank Diane Mueller and Alexa Overbay who put this event together. So, big round of applause. <laughs> so, I think this is our sixth, sixth one of these now. Sixth one, and Sixth there'll event. be a few more coming and up, And it's too. just amazing to see the attendance grow, and, um, and Diana and Alexa do a great job, and everybody else that, that works with them, so really appreciate the effort. Um, so yeah, so please uh, raise your hand if you have questions. Who would like to Things go that first? you like, things that you hate. Front row. <laughs> Front row, yes. Uh, things that you don't like, things that you'd like to see us work on, new features you'd like to see, just ah, we'll use this, this <laughs> ask us anything. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, okay. When can end users can uh, can when can end users expect to see the first result of the merger between the CoreOS GUI and the existing OpenShift console? Great. Uh, so the question was uh, the results of uh, the merger. When when we're going to start to see that? So so we we did this acquisition uh, just three months ago uh, now, and we've been uh, working together ever since. So the Pat and CoreOS uh, PM and engineering teams. Um, for the OpenShift customers, you know we're doing releases every three months. Uh, so the next release is 3.10, uh, which is in June. Um, uh, yeah, June, July, whatever. <laughs> uh, 3.10 in June. We have 3.11 in September and 3.12 in December. Already in June, you'll, you'll be able to have some things that won't be in the product, but you'll be able to try them out. Uh, we're we're going to run some, some previews and some betas of things like operators, and, uh, and even here at Summit, you'll be able to see some demos of how the integrated console is coming together. Um, I would say in 3.11 uh, in September and 3.12 in December is when you'll see the bulk of the integrated features, and you'll see those products coming together. Our goal is by the end of this year to have uh, CoreOS, Tectonic, and OpenShift completely converged, uh, all the critical features. Uh, that's, the, that's what we're operating at. You know, hopefully uh, we can get more stuff out sooner to you uh, in the fall. Um, and you know, hopefully there's no delays on anything. But, but yeah, I think uh, 3.11 and 3.12 is when you'll see that. So second half of this year. Go ahead. Yeah, with 3.9, we have the introduction of uh, supporting the cryo runtime. Mm -hmm. um, can you touch on? Um, how you intend to cover things like best practices for building uh, containers without using Docker tools, things like using Builda or, or whatever else, and then how is that going to be how is that going to be reflected in the overall building images within OpenShift from a developer standpoint? So I'm going to let Steve talk about the the build tools here in just a second. Um, just for folks who don't know, uh, so OpenShift uh, ships uh, with RHEL, and that includes uh, the RHEL Docker runtime, right? Which is Red Hat's packaged ver version of the Docker now Moby uh, upstream. Uh, about a year ago, we started working on an alternate OCI runtime called Cryo, uh, uh, and basically for a number of reasons, you know, something that was um, daemonless, lighter weight, secure. Uh, was specifically focused on Kubernetes and would be stable for all upstream releases. 
but Cryo and Docker, they're OCI compliant runtime. So you can take your any Docker container and run it on either. In fact, you wouldn't even know the difference if you're running it in Kubernetes and OpenShift because it's it's sort of underneath the covers. Um, so um, so in addition to to the runtime, we have been working on a set of uh, build tools, things like uh, like Builda and so forth. I'll let Steve talk about that. And yeah, so so Builder itself uh, takes a similar approach to the Docker daemon, but just doesn't require the Docker daemon. And we're doing work to bring t together the Docker file-based build so you can um, plug in uh, Builda. We already had a tool, uh, tech preview we had done with this image builder tool, which, which has uh, other, uh, I guess, qualities like that that doesn't depend on Docker itself. And uh, we'll continue to invest. I know that Google um, put out a, a Canico tool that's like this. It takes a slightly different approach. Um, that was one of the things we talked with them last week at uh, KubeCon and EU was sort of what it's like going forward in a, if you will, a Docker daemonless or Docker toolless world on a, and also how to leverage more of a Kubernetes primitives to do the build. So we're continuing to evolve that. I would, I would only add, you, you mentioned best practices. In the next two releases, Joe mentioned 3.10 and 3.11, you'll see some performance information of what we're pumping out of cryo coming out. You'll also see the cryo control command and how to use that and how to use that as compared to Podman when you're using these new runtimes that are being offered in Kubernetes. So all that's probably coming out between, what is it, June, May, June, June and September. Yeah, so, so we see strong standards now for container runtime and container format with the Open Container Initiative uh, specs having reached 1.0 and a ton of in innovation in new build tools and new methodologies for, for building standard OCI images and, and you know, build a Podman. These are some projects that we've been investing in for the future uh, to give you more options for that. Okay. I got one way here in the back. Okay. Hello. Um, I know I'm real excited, with like, for example, with the operator um, interface for Vault and things like that, but maybe could you talk a little bit more about, um, you know, at a high level, security moving forward for the native OpenShift secrets and uh, maybe using more secure our algorithms for that? Do you want to talk about secret management? Or? So the, the question was about um, secret management in OpenShift or C groups, secret management. Se yeah, secrets, secrets in Kubernetes, secrets in OpenShift. Sure. So the um, one of the most exciting projects in Kubernetes right now is a KMS API. So you'll be able to attach this service that will come native in Kubernetes. You know, it's in alpha, so you got at least two more releases to wait to the back end of whatever you happen to have. At the same time, while that's baking, we are creating integrations with a lot of the vendors that you've indicated are the most popular, uh, from CyberArk to HashiCorp to whatever the case may be, on how that interfaces with how you create what would be, have been a secret. Uh, the only downfall to that is that you aren't using the secret API object in that case, right? You're, you're still working with a secret bit of information, but you're not storing it in the secret API. The KMS service that's coming in the next two releases of Kubernetes will allow you to save that in the secret a API object. Yeah, so by default, we're storing secrets in etcd in Kubernetes, right? So etcd is your secrets vault, but we know many customers would prefer to use a CyberArk or a HashiCorp vault. So we want to make uh, that work seamlessly across the board, whether you're using uh, etcd, whether you're using a third-party vault solution, that you know the, the experience would be the same. Um, yeah. Here, go ahead, Jim. And in a, like a couple weeks ago, what CoreOS did um, was actually open source our vault operator. So previously, that was shipping as a proprietary operator with Tectonic, and now it's open source and can be ran on any Kubernetes cluster. So you can go out and install that today um, and start using like an automatically managed vault instance that runs HA. Um, it's not the actual config map, as they were saying, uh, but it is a, you can think of it as like an Amazon key service running on your cluster Kubernetes native. And as you can uh, hear, hopefully, there's been a lot of investment in improving secrets management in a number of different ways. So just in case you didn't know, in etcd, you can encrypt, secrets are encrypted by default as of 3.6.1. Um, and some of the vault integrations that Mike was talking about uh, that as they're looking at KMS, in the near term, there are integrations available using other methods, using the flex volume API. So lots of investment. Yeah, just one more thing on Jimmy's point. Um, you heard about the operator framework this morning. You'll be hearing about 
operators that we're going to be building for all of our platform components. Everything that runs on Kubernetes and OpenShift will have an operator so that we can automate the operation. So that's everything from etcd, which uh, with Tectonic already had an operator for Prometheus. We're going to do one for Elasticsearch and Kibana. Um, basically, all of our self-hosted components. And then we're also exposing operators out uh, for end user services, so things that you would uh, provision through the service catalog, but things that you want somebody else to operate for you. And I used the example this morning, a developer wants to consume a database, but he doesn't want to be the DBA, so how do you build operations? So, so Jimmy was referring to the Vault operator, which is an operator that they built for the open source Vault project, um, and, and that's something that you'll be able to try out on OpenShift. Um, obviously, if you want a commercially supported uh, Vault itself, you know, Cyber, uh, sorry, HashiCorp is a partner. CyberArk is also a partner, so we we don't take sides. <laughs> um, so so uh, so please uh, check those things out and and, uh, and give us your feedback. Hey, um, I'm looking for an official image for Artemis ActiveMQ7, and never got. So I was looking for this image and. I heard that will be a service on the cluster like logs and metrics and we have like a broker, a message broker as a service in the, in the cluster. Uh, do you know something about it? If you coming on the ne next version or? So, so I didn't catch what image you were asking about our yeah, technology. We are, we are trying to use the Artemis, use the ActiveMQ7. Archimedes, is that what yeah, you said? Yeah, Artemis. I'm not familiar with Archimedes and stuff. There, there may be images uh, in the community. Um, yeah, because the oh, the last official image is the 6.3 of ActiveMQ, and so okay. I will look for the new one, but never got. And I heard that will be comes like a service on the cluster platform. Yeah, let's let's follow up with that afterwards. I'll I'll dig into more. Yeah, we, okay. we can dig into that. A lot of times what, what we see is people bringing a lot of uh, either community images or their own custom images to OpenShift. Um, and, and that's great. We have a, a lot of um, then ISV partners that will uh, provide supported versions of those things. We have a lot of our own uh, stuff in our portfolio, but that's just one that I'm not familiar with. But we can follow up and see if either there's a plan for a Red Hat image or one of our partners uh, to have that as a supported offering. So, All right. Here in the middle. Hey, how's it going? Um, any plans for playbook support for disconnected environments for helping gather all the prereqs, Docker images, all that, making upgrades and patching easier? Yeah, so the um, there has been issues reported with our disconnected installation. There's just baked into it some expectation that some things would be able to be pulled. So we've hunted most of them down. The, the thing that's missing is the post-install activities. So uh, where Jenkins has to pull, where NPMs would have to pull, where Jim servers would have to pull, kind of your artifacts, that is still not mastered. But we, um, in 3.10, we, we definitely solved all the other disconnected issues. Yeah, it's something we're always working on. We have a, a number of customers, you know, in public sector, in, in, in financial services that have to run disconnected installs, offline environments. Um, and as you can imagine, there's a lot of, when you're dealing with you know, images and Maven repos and all this stuff, there's a lot of stuff where the software wants to reach out. Uh, but, um, but we do uh, constantly evolve those capabilities. And I think, uh, to Mike's point, with 310, we've made another set of enhancements. And we keep looking for feedback on you know, folks that are, if you're still running into stuff that, that we can continue to improve. So, so those playbooks should be in the installer. Uh, and, uh, and then those enhancements will come out with each, each release. So. Uh, hi. Uh, a, a question. Um, with introduction or future introduction of Tectonic into platform, what's the future of CloudForm? So the question was around uh, the, the future of CloudForm. So, so CloudForms is continue on. There's a, uh, CloudForms is um, Red Hat's hybrid management solution. Uh, we also have an uh, OpenShift um, uh, provider in CloudForms to, to pull stats from OpenShift. But those stats would come from our monitoring agents and stuff within OpenShift, right? So, um, so a couple of things. One is we we'd gotten feedback from customers that wanted 
admin capabilities baked right into OpenShift, right? They just wanted to be able to log into OpenShift, and if they're an administrator, to be able to see the health of their cluster, the health of their services. And you know, with the um, with the Tectonic console baked in, that's that's exactly what you're going to get, right? So now, what you see when you log into OpenShift will be tied to your role. And if your role is cluster administrator, you're going to be able to see information on the health of the cluster. All those same metrics will still get fed out, whether that's to our monitoring solutions like Cloudform's Insights, or whether that's to third-party solutions, you can hook into those Prometheus monitors and, and get data out of the system. Um, and then likewise, the, we're, we're dramatically enhancing, uh, extending our Prometheus monitoring capabilities. So the Tectonic team had a, a great uh, Prometheus team that had done a lot of work uh, around uh, Prometheus monitoring, and so that's helping us accelerate the, the amount of monitoring data that we're able to provide. Um, on the flip side, they didn't have a logging stack. We had, you know, our log management stack. So, so can bringing these th metrics and logging together for uh, for the cluster administrator within uh, OpenShift is is a key key, uh, key focus. Uh, day two management is a big theme, uh, and automated operations. Um, but that doesn't sort of supplant uh, Red Hat's management portfolio. We still have, you know, satellite and cloud forms and insights and and Ansible very much a part of the portfolio, and they'll go beyond just OpenShift administration into RHEL administration, uh, infrastructure beneath OpenShift and beyond, and, and that's kind of, uh, we're just going to provide much richer data within OpenShift and, uh, and as feeds out, so. I just want to clarify, all that uh, observability uh, functionality in OpenShift is for the cluster itself. It is not for applications running on top of the cluster. It's right. focusing on the cluster health itself, the cluster logs itself. You should not point all of your applications to that stack, or else you'll tank the cluster stack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't want to do and that. Then, and then through through the operators, then we'll be able to start uh, uh, providing more observability into the into the services uh, th through the uh, through the operator framework. Yeah, you'll be able to provision your own stacks similar to this, specifically for your applications in an automated fashion. But we want to isolate that stack from your actual applications so that your applications don't crash the cluster. And uh, another question? Oh. Diane, we got we got two on the mics, and if you want to cut it after that, that was yep. there. So up in front. Sorry. You. Yep. Um, various people have talked about having multiple clusters um, and deploying applications across those multiple clusters. The work on Kube Fed seems to have disappeared into the background a bit. A lot of people are using Jenkins. Where do you see this going? Sure. The, um, so the SIG is back on track. Um, in the past couple of weeks, if you guys aren't following the Federation SIG or the multi-cluster SIG, um, there is now a Federation version 2 uh, where the ideas and the concepts of that large federated control plane have been broken up into CRDs and smaller objects where you can do workload and policy on how you want to target your clusters. Uh, you can also do a different CRD and choose to install it or not install it for DNS that would span multiple clusters. So now you have a choice of which components that you want to use. The proposals are out, and there's also a, a proof of concept um, implementation of one of the proposals called uh, Fenord. Uh, so definitely take a look at that. That allows you to do a lot of what you could have done in the previous iteration of Federation. Um, this will probably come to bear it towards the end of this year. Um, in the middle of this year, you'll get cluster registry, which is a great step forward. You can like have one central API to ask where are all my clusters, what are their names, what secrets are in them, things of that nature. Uh, we also brought in some technology from CoreOS. CoreOS was um, syncing um, up at the project level mainly, so stuff like the namespace, uh, stuff like some of the config maps, not, not the replica sets or anything like that. Uh, but if you wanted a consistent look and feel of all your projects, we have that technology coming out towards the end of this year, too. So those will all come together towards the end of this year. Yeah, I, th I think it's safe to say that the, uh, the initial Kubernetes Federation project, Kubernetes Federation 1.0, was a bit too ambitious and the implementation too monolithic in terms of, you know, what all the problems it was trying to solve and the implementation for how they were trying to solve it, right? But the problem didn't go away, right? Uh, you know, all of our customers, including I think most of customers here, are running multiple Kubernetes clusters. Many of you are running apps that span active, active across multiple clusters. So the problems that Federation was uh, meant to solve around multi-cluster management, federated ingress, federated deployments, and so forth are still there. And so uh, this is kind of what we, we always caution people, you know, 
just because you see something announced in the upstream or you watch the Kelsey Hightower video or something, <laughs> you need to really be careful in terms of the state of a feature, right? If it's alpha in Kubernetes or beta in Kubernetes, that actually means something. It means that the you know the APIs and the feature itself isn't stable. So we you know we you know that's kind of why we try to be clear in terms of what's uh, GA and OpenShift, what's tech preview, and what's still you know kind of in an experimental stage upstream. Um, one last thing on the um, uh, the I think it's the Office of Technology track at Summit. Uh, if you look on your agenda, I think there is actually a session where they're going to be talking about. Uh, what's coming out of the uh, now the multi-cluster SIG. Yeah. Ivan and Font, if you look up his name in the agenda. Ivan Font has a session, including features this year. So the multi, uh, one of these modules that got broken out is the multi-cluster registry, uh, which is a registry to store meta information on all the different clusters that'll aid your deployment tools. And then there's progress on ingress, on deployments and stuff. And I, I don't know if you want to talk any more about the core. Um, yeah, Rob Zumsky just had a talk at KubeCon EU uh, like a couple of days ago talking about this in more depth, too. If you want to watch the video of that, I think is already up on YouTube. Yeah, yeah Rob is one of our uh, core OS, the another uh, core SPM that just joined our team. He's going to be doing a keynote demo tomorrow, but he did a session last week at KubeCon. So if you check out the KubeCon site, you'll find the, the video. And uh, if not, just reach out to us. We'll send, send you the video on that. All right, so we've got one last one here in the middle. Uh, I don't want to put any pressure on you, but there's about 500 people that would like a beer. So the excellence of your question is, is based on this, this one, so no pressure. Cool. Uh, right now we have the option to either uh, um, deploy nodes on a rel-based install or an atomic-based install. Um, when Tectonic is fully integrated at the end of the year, will we have a third option or the, the two existing yep. ones gonna evolve? So the so question was around uh, the host options for OpenShift, right? So, um, so OpenShift is gonna always be supported on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and I'd say the majority of our customers have been running OpenShift on RHEL because they want a traditional RPM managed distro. They already have you know all the tools and processes in place. Um, obviously, CoreOS launched uh, Container Linux. That was the first product that that started the company, uh, and then uh, c competitively, Red Hat launched RHEL Atomic Host. Uh, we're now bringing those two teams together, um, and. Uh, don't tell anybody, but there's going to be an announcement out tomorrow, and the, the new joint offering is going to be called Red Hat Core OS. And it's, you can think of it as the merger of uh, Atomic Host with Core OS Container Linux, uh, and that's going to give you a, a fully immutable, container-optimized, uh, and fully automated <laughs> uh, 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 host, uh, because one of the things that we learned with, from the Core OS team is it wasn't just about the distribution, it's about the automation that you could put around that distribution when you have a fully immutable host. Um, so again, um, we'll be talking about that tomorrow in my session, CoreOS uh, and Red Hat. Um, and then on Wednesday, there's a specific session that's just about um, container Linux and uh, uh, atomic host. I think it's called The Road Ahead. Uh, and um, so if you want more information, come to one or both of those sessions. Um, we, we think they're both great options, but we do see a lot of momentum towards uh, full immutability down to the host and a lot of Linux administrators who would traditionally, you know, have done, you know, RPMs or Debian managed kind of distributions really looking for uh, that, uh, that immutability and, and the benefits that it provides, so. A huge thank you to all of the speakers today. Um, if, you're, if you were a speaker, could you just stand up for a minute? This is speed dating. So, so I know you weren't all counting, but when these five folks came up, we went over 51 people speaking on this stage today. And so I really want to thank all of you for sticking with us and listening to all these stories. But now you have 51 faces to find in the hallways of Red Hat Summit to connect with, to figure out how you're going to collaborate with them, to get lessons learned from. So please take advantage of the beer that's about to be poured and um, find someone and have a good conversation. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.